Take a look at this electrocardiogram. We know it's from an elderly patient with heart failure and a previous ECG showing rapid atrial fibrillation. She now presents to the emergency room complaining of nausea. We have this current ECG. In other words, she was treated some time ago for rapid atrial fibrillation. Was her medication adjusted? She went home and some time later, she returned with complaints of nausea and this ECG was obtained. So what is the diagnosis? What is your opinion on it? In our previous video, we concluded by presenting this ECG for you to ponder. Today, we bring you the answer. Welcome back to another engaging lesson focused on electrocardiographic tracings. In this session, we will dive into a discussion about various electrocardiogram patterns. Here, we present the same electrocardiogram again. I recommend pausing the video to carefully analyze this ECG before continuing the discussion. Examining the electrocardiogram at hand, the striking aspect is that we are unable to discern the P wave. As we analyze the QRS complexes, we notice that despite being bradycardic, which means we're observing a bradycardic rhythm, it remains irregular. This observation strongly supports the likelihood of atrial fibrillation. However, instead of high ventricular response, it is exhibiting a low ventricular response. The patient is also experiencing nausea. Why is this happening? Upon scrutinizing the ventricular repolarization, we detect an alteration in the ST segment. This anomaly is visible across all leads, particularly if you look at leads D2 or V3 to V6. This pattern is akin to what we term as a spoon sign. This sign is not indicative of digitalis toxicity, but of digitalis saturation. However, when we consider the woman's symptoms of nausea and observe atrial fibrillation with low ventricular response, we must suspect that this patient may be experiencing digitalis toxicity. Therefore, we identify atrial fibrillation with a ventricular response combined with ST changes that are compatible with digitalis intoxication or ischemia. In reality, these ST segment alterations are compatible with digitalis saturation. Yet, when combined with the symptoms of nausea and atrial fibrillation with a low ventricular response, we need to consider digitalis toxicity. While these ECG changes don't conclusively rule out ischemia, based on the clinical presentation, we can infer they are likely secondary to digitalis toxicity. Recall that when a patient suffers from digitalis toxicity, they may experience a range of arrhythmias, from tachyrhythmias to bradyrrhythmias. Examples of bradyrrhythmias that may occur include sinus bradycardia, synotrial block, or the patient might endure such an extreme bradycardia that it evolves into a junctional escape rhythm or atrioventricular blocks ranging from first-degree AV block to complete heart block. In terms of tachyrrhythmias, the patient could develop junctional tachycardia, atrial tachycardia with variable block, or even experience an increase in the number of ventricular ectopic beats, ranging from isolated ventricular ectopic beats to ventricular tachycardia or even ventricular fibrillation, potentially leading to death. Remember, certain factors can predispose an individual to digitalis toxicity, meaning a high serum level of digoxin in the blood. When these factors are present, a patient can transition from saturation to toxicity because the therapeutic range of digoxin is very narrow. Therefore, the margin between therapeutic and toxic serum levels is quite slim. When these factors are present, even patients under digoxin therapy can progress to toxicity. These factors include patients with cardiac amyloidosis, those with chronic lung disease, who have a higher propensity to develop toxicity, patients with hypercalcemia or hypokalemia, and those with hypomagnesemia. Additionally, patients with hypothyroidism, hyposemia, those undergoing an acute myocardial infarction, the elderly, and those with renal insufficiency are also predisposed to toxicity, as these conditions can decrease digoxin clearance. Moreover, patients with atrial fibrillation and Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome are at a higher risk for digitalis toxicity when using digitalis drugs such as digoxin. Now on to the new clinical scenario. We are going to proceed as follows. We will display several electrocardiograms and ask you which of the medications from a list of alternatives could potentially cause the changes in the ECG we're about to show. So for the first ECG, we want to know which of the following medications might cause the electrocardiographic changes that we'll observe.
For this upcoming ECG, our medication options are Digoxin, Captoprol, Amiodarone, Metaprolol, and Veripamil. Now, let's analyze this electrocardiogram. You should pause the video to review the tracings before we discuss. In this ECG, we only have some precordial leads, namely V2, V3, V5, and V6. At first glance, it appears to be a sinus rhythm with each QRS complex present. The PR interval seems normal, and I cannot identify any notable changes related to the QRS complex itself. When we observe the ventricular repolarization, we can see that the QT interval, which spans from the start of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave, is substantially prolonged. If we were to measure this interval, we have about 18 millimeters, which would equate to 720 milliseconds or 0.72 seconds. Normally, we accept a range up to 400 to 470 milliseconds in women, depending on the case. Remember, QT intervals that are significantly prolonged, those above 500 milliseconds are much more predisposed to ventricular arrhythmias. This prolonged QT interval could be due to the patient's bradycardia. We can correct this for the heart rate by dividing the QT interval by the square root of the RR interval, which in this case is 29 millimeters or 1.16 seconds. Even after this correction, we have a QT interval of 660 milliseconds or 0.66 seconds, which is a considerably prolonged interval. This prolonged QT interval is risky as it can predispose the patient to arrhythmias, particularly polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, known as torsades to points. Among the medications mentioned earlier, which ones could prolong the QT interval? Of all the options, amiodarone is the likely cause of this ECG alteration. Remember in such cases where you have an extremely prolonged QT interval and the patient is using a medication that can prolong the QT interval, especially when it exceeds 500 milliseconds, the medication should be discontinued. It is crucial to check the potassium and magnesium levels of these patients. The serum levels of potassium and magnesium should be increased, aiming for the upper limit of normal as hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia can further predispose to ventricular tachyrhythmias. In addition to amiodarone, various other drugs can also lengthen the QT interval, including other antiarrhythmics. Notably, sotalol significantly prolongs the QT interval, thereby increasing the risk of ventricular arrhythmias. Therefore, for patients, especially women using sotalol, monitoring of the QT interval is essential. The QT interval should be measured before and after the introduction of the medication. If the interval substantially increases or exceeds 500 milliseconds, we should consider changing or discontinuing the medication. Some antihistamines can also lengthen the QT interval as can macrolides, primarily erythromycin, and fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin. Halopridol, commonly used in ICU for agitated elderly patients, can also increase the QT interval, especially when the patient is on other medications that already prolong the QT interval. This can further increase the risk of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Tricyclic antidepressants and some prokinetic agents can also contribute to a prolonged QT interval. The next electrocardiogram trace is from a 75-year-old asymptomatic male patient who underwent an ECG during the elective preoperative assessment for an ophthalmic surgery. Let's take a look at the ECG. Evaluating the ECG trace, we observe that the patient is in sinus rhythm. Examining the complexes, the PR interval seems borderline normal, between 180 to 200 milliseconds. On analyzing the QRS complexes, particularly in the inferior leads, we notice a QS complex, indicating the absence of an R wave, suggesting a potential old inferior wall myocardial infarction. Shifting to the chest leads from V1 to V6 in V2, we notice a tall R wave with no S wave, indicating a possible mirror image of a QS complex from the posterior wall, suggesting a prior posterior wall infarction. Additionally, in V5 and V6, we notice a pathological Q wave in V6 and reduced QRS complex amplitude, indicating necrosis in this area. Thus, although the patient is asymptomatic, the ECG indicates a history of a transbural anterior myocardial infarction affecting the entire inferior wall and part of the posterolateral region. 
We can define this as an old inferoposterolateral myocardial infarction. Thank you for taking the time to learn with us today. Please share this video with your colleagues, subscribe to our channel, and give us a positive evaluation. We hope to see you soon in our next video.